you to all the members of our group that have contributed towards the research. Our group works at the interface between the science and engineering of electrochemical devices, including batteries, fuel cells, capacitors and redox flow cells. We tend to work with industry to solve applied problems, but in order to do so, we do fundamental science. Our favourite type of challenge to solve is when industry has a problem that no matter how good their engineers are, cannot be solved because of a lack of understanding of the science, enabling our research to have an immediate and significant impact. I will be talking about the thermal management of lithium ion batteries today. Our philosophy is to have a solution orientated approach, which means that in order to model an electrochemical system, we first must have observed some behaviour that needs explaining. Our research is therefore always experimental data driven. We then seek to create models that can explain the phenomena, seeking to understand the simplest model possible, and therefore only including the science necessary. Once we have done this, these are very powerful tools for optimization, both of the device itself or how to get the best out of it in an application. We have applied this approach to multiple different battery chemistries, including solid state, lithium sulfur, lithium hybrid capacitors, and of course, lithium ion. I'm going to almost entirely talk about thermal management of lithium ion batteries, but I wanted to briefly show you how we apply this philosophy to other chemistries too, with an example that's also relevant to the rest of the talk. In this paper, we showed how important understanding the thermal coupling within a lithium sulfur battery was, and artificially reproduced a thermal gradient across a large pouch cell by connecting single layer pouch cells held at different temperatures in parallel. What you can see here in the bottom figure is the impedance or the internal resistance for a lithium sulfur cell. In particular, it has a unique volcano relationship where as you are discharging, the resistance increases until it reaches a maximum and then begins to decrease afterwards. What this means, combined with a temperature effect, you can see that the resistance is, as you'd expect, lower at higher temperatures, means that we see significant detrimental positive feedback, which can result from internal thermal gradients. Essentially, a hot layer in the middle of a cell, because the heat is harder to get out, can race down the state of charges quicker, can discharge itself quicker than the colder layers on the outside. As it's going up that volcano, it's self-limiting, that holds it back. But as soon as the hot layer gets over the peak of the volcano, it can race down the other side and discharge itself even quicker, leaving the cold layers significantly further behind. A few years ago, we demonstrated a similar phenomena for lithium ion pouch cells. We showed how both the usable capacity and the rate of degradation can be significantly worse for a pouch cell under aggressive use when surface cooling compared to tab cooling. In this experiment, we used at the time our unique capability of using pelter elements to do surface cooling of a battery. We attached our pelter elements to the surface and in the other configuration for tab cooling, we attached them to the tabs. We then kept them at the same constant temperature and cycled the cell in all other ways identically. What we observed is that for the surface cooled cell, you can see that the usable capacity was about 10% less than the tab cooled cell, and also the rate of degradation was about three times worse. Now, in order to explain this result, we reproduced the beginning of life behavior in a model, and we demonstrated that this was a result of large internal thermal gradients within the jelly roll region for surface cooling. And these lead to significant inhomogeneities in current, which leads to lower usable capacity, even at the beginning of life. Essentially, at the end of a charge or a discharge, a large amount of current is having to flow through a small number of cold layers. And so the voltage cutoff is reached sooner. The inhomogeneities in current then also leads to inhomogeneous degradation, which further exacerbates the current inhomogeneities and leads to faster degradation. To explain the plots on the left, you can see that we've got the surface cooled cell on the left and the tab cooled cell on the right. And what we're showing in the colours is the inhomogeneity. 
So the top four figures moving forward in time from naught seconds to the end of the discharge, you can see the four figures showing the thermal inhomogeneity building up for the surface cooled cell, whereas for the tab cooled cell, there is much, much smaller thermal inhomogeneity. The surface cooled cell, we see a thermal gradient of eight degrees reached, whereas it's only 1.4 degrees for a tab cooled cell. And then the two lines at the bottom, the sort of very bottom is the state of charge in homogeneity that is created at the end of the discharge. And then in the middle is the current in homogeneity just before the discharge ends. You can see that we have significant difference in current. The average discharge was 6C, whereas we might see some layers experiencing 9C and some 3C for the surface cooled cell, whereas the inhomogeneity is only 10% for the tab cooled cell. This led us to conclude that tab cooling should always be the best way of cooling pouch cells. However, further research we conducted on other cells demonstrated that this is not always the case. We realized the problem is that most cells are not designed well for thermal management. Tabs are too small or too few, and very few cells have been optimized for the behavior of the cell as a whole for a given application that takes into account not just the capacity, but also the usable capacity, considering the thermal management system design. The result is that in many cases, surface cooling is the only option despite its consequences. In the past, the battery industry has been very competitive and for the last few decades has been very successful focusing on energy density and cost because these can be compared and competed, and that's what customers have asked for. However, there was no metric to enable how easy or hard it is to cool a cell that would enable a customer to determine if a cell is good or bad. Therefore, there has been minimal incentive for competition to make cells better. To overcome this, we have proposed the cell cooling coefficient, which can be measured empirically for any cell. It is independent of form factor, chemistry, manufacturer, or how the cell is going to be used. It is a lumped material property of a given cell, and therefore can be reproduced by anyone, anywhere, with relatively simple and standardized equipment where they have the same cell. Although it has the same units, it is different from other measures such as thermal conductivity, in that it is designed specifically for an electrochemical device that generates heat throughout its body. And it's calculated from the th temperature gradient between the hottest and coldest part of the cell being cooled that is necessary to reject a unit of heat through the surface being cooled. A cell will therefore have different cell cooling coefficients for different surfaces, i.e. surface versus tab or side versus base for cylindrical. Armed with this new metric, we could then begin designing cells to improve it and measure the impact this had on their performance. In this study, we had cells commissioned, physically made, where we varied tab position and thickness and how this influenced their thermal behavior. We did this experimentally. The cells were otherwise identical except for the tabs. The reason we did this was to validate our models so that we could then use them to explore other degrees of freedom. To explain the figures, you can see here that we've done a discharge and you can see the temperature rise during that discharge. The control was surface cooling, one of the cells, all of them behaved the same for surface cooling. And then you can see the three different examples. On the top, the cell that gets hottest had two narrow tabs at the same side. The cell that was ever so slightly cooler had the two same narrow tabs, but on opposing sides. And then the cell that performed best for tab cooling, i.e. had the lowest temperature rise, had much wider tabs on opposite sides. So we took that model, validated on the custom cells, and we modified it to create a model of the LG Chem E63 cell, which is a standard automotive large pouch cell. In the model, we could then conduct multiple virtual design studies to see if we could improve the design of the cell. 
one of the most important variables turned out to be tab thickness, as the cross-sectional area of the tab was considerably less than the sum of all of the current collectors. Therefore, by opening up this thermal bottleneck, we could achieve tab cooling rates approaching surface cooling without the disadvantages of surface cooling, i.e. large internal thermal gradients within the jelly roll region. What you can see here on the bottom left in the figure is along the x-axis the discharge rate. So in the model, we could conduct multiple experiments. And then on the left on the y-axis, you can see the temperature rise. So what we're plotting here is at the end of a discharge, the difference between the minimum and maximum temperature within the jelly roll region of the cell. You can see at low discharge rates, it's both a low temperature rise and smaller differences, smaller thermal gradients. And at higher discharge rates, understandably, higher uh, maximum temperature rise and also larger inhomogeneities. What you can see between surface and tab cooling, in the, for every case, tab cooling by increasing the thickness, we could match the maximum temperature rise, so the tab cooled cell would get no hotter than the surface cooling equivalent, but it would have smaller thermal inhomogeneities. And based upon our previous research, we would expect this to result in significant improvements in both usable capacity and lifetime. We've subsequently expanded this work to include cylindrical cells and also prismatic cells. For cylindrical cells, as we showed in this paper, the situation is far more complex. Surface cooling is equivalent to side cooling, which causes similar problems, i.e. large in thermal inhomogeneities. However, most jelly rolls have just a few small tabs. These cause large current inhomogeneities as well and make tab cooling ineffective. Except for base cooling, where essentially because the whole can is the tab, base cooling also gives you partial side cooling. The only conclusion we can reach is essentially that you need to increase the number of tabs between the jelly roll region and the terminals, or even as Tesla have done with their new tabless cell, make the contact between the current collector and the terminals continuous. We don't have any of these cells, so we can't test and verify the results yet, but we've reproduced a tabless version of the cylindrical cell we were modeling, showing that it can achieve impressive cooling rates with minimal internal thermal gradients. The figure that you can see in the middle on the right there is showing the result for the cell, the, 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 the LG chem cylindrical cell that we were modeling, and the different points are showing which surfaces we cooled. So a bold line, so the points on the top um, left are where we're cooling every surface conductively, which is the best type of cooling. Now you can see that on the x-axis, they give us a very low difference in the average temperature. So essentially, the temperature of the cell is not increased by very much over a discharge, but they're quite high up on the y-axis, and that is the difference internally, so the thermal inhomogeneity. It means that we can get good cooling rates, but there's large internal thermal gradients. And then as we go to the right, we're cooling fewer surfaces. We can start to see that we can get less good cooling with similar internal thermal gradients. And essentially where we want to be, which is in the bottom left, which is a low temperature rise and low internal thermal gradients, we can't get there with the existing design of cell, regardless of how we thermally manage it. What we need to do is to create a tabless or a cell with the term with the tabs all the way around and then we can achieve both. We can achieve both a low temperature rise and low internal thermal inhomogeneities. For the prismatic cells it's a similar story to cylindrical cells. Tabs are few and far between making side or base cooling the only practical methods of extracting heat. We have not seen anyone optimise a cell for terminal or tab cooling yet, yet we would expect to see similar improvements if it was technically possible. However, in this paper, we did demonstrate that it should be possible to significantly improve the side or base cooling rates through simply changing the casing material. Also of interest is the bottom figure showing the cell thickness. Clearly, 
you know, if we're side cooling, we can increase the cell cooling coefficient by making the cell thinner, but it affects our energy density. You know, the parasitic mass of the casing material becomes more, more relatively more of the total of the cell. What you can see is that most prismatic cells are about as far right on this graph as is possible, which shows you quite how far the battery industry optimizes for energy density over thermal management as, as it currently stands. Earlier, I said that the cell cooling coefficient can even be used to compare different cells and form factors. And one of the simplest ways of doing this is to normalize for capacity. A larger cell clearly generates more heat, and so a larger cell is larger cell cooling coefficient is needed. Therefore, dividing by capacity enables different sized cells to be compared to each other. It's clear from the numbers we've measured, some of them shown here, from a range of different cells, that surface cooling of pouch cells is an order of magnitude more effective than any other method of cooling for any other type of cell. However, we've yet to find a single cell that cannot be improved, suggesting that there are substantial opportunities across the entire industry for every cell to significantly improve cell design and performance. Our research has shown that the benefits are likely to be considerable, including percentage increases in usable capacity and energy, and many multiples in cycle life, both of which would also contribute to percentage reductions in mass and volume at the pack level and significant reductions in life cycle costs and environmental impacts through extended lifetimes. Thank you for your attention and thank you to all the researchers in our group, past and present, who contributed to this work, some of them shown here in a pre-COVID photo.